I am Vinnie Tolerich, folks. Your good intentions have been stolen, but don't worry. I'm here to help you get them back. You may be soft and succulent when we start this process, but hang in there before long, you'll be lean and mean. Guaranteed. Uh, welcome to the Friday show. This is the one where we bring people on with way more knowledge than I could ever have. This guy started coming on my show a long time ago. When I say a long I probably will ask him, but probably seven or eight years ago was the first time uh, we spoke to Dr. Fung. And um, we, I think the first time we actually spoke just about low carb, you know, cutting out some of the sugars and uh, eating more fat. But then something changed and Dr. Fung started talking about helping people with type 2 diabetes, people with fatty liver disease, people with metabolic syndrome by not eating, by fasting. And at the time, you know, like the, the world has come a long way since then. At the time, people go, what? Don't eat. What are you talking about? And folks, I don't suggest anyone just wake up in the morning and decide not to eat. Bad idea good idea if you get in touch with someone like uh, Dr. Fung and do it in a scientific way. Medical fasting is what we're talking about today. So without any further ado, uh, Dr. Jason Fung, how are you doing, Jason? I'm good, Vinny. How are you? Great, man. It, it's been a while since we had you back on the show, right? It's been a while. Yeah. Like I was, I was just listening to you. I think it probably has been seven or eight years because my book, um, you know, The Obesity Code and the Complete Guide to Fasting were published in 2016. So I started writing them probably about 2014, 2015. So probably it's been at least, you know, seven or eight years. I mean, well, you, you've you been can... on since then, but the first time you the were first on, time. Uh, yeah. 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 I think uh, before you haven't been on in at least three and a half years because I moved to Virginia three years ago and you right. haven't been on since I've been in Virginia. So it's, it's been a minute. Yeah, it's been it's been a bit. I mean, it's it, things have changed a lot, as you said. I mean, first time we talked, I mean, people were thought fasting was just the craziest thing they've ever heard about. Right. It was uh, yeah. you, you probably remember that. It's um, sure. You know, so, so a lot has changed in terms of the perception. The medical science hasn't changed, right? But the the perception of it as a as a reasonable option for people is 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 completely changed around. Well, when you think about it, when guys like me started, you know, I did, uh, you know, I started the podcast about a year and a half before I put my book out. My book was ready to go. Um, I just thought I had to build an audience before we tried to put it out, and. And I tell people all the time back then, 11 years ago, I was loath to mention the word ketogenic on a podcast or even in my book or anywhere because we were just considered kooks back then. Yeah. You know, with my clients around LA, the people who knew they had to lose weight for a movie role or a TV role or whatever, they were like, hey, bring it on. We got money to make here. You know, when there's money involved, you know, people just go. Look, you, you went to UCLA, you were in Los Angeles, you know how people are there, they don't care yeah. how the sausage is packed, just give me the sausage, right. And so my clients were into it. But boy, when you talk to the, the worldwide web, what we were calling it back then, and I was afraid to say the word keto, you you came on you for the early times, we were just talking about, you know, low carb, high fat, that kind of thing. Um, I remember at the time you were somehow associated with uh, Jimmy Moore, who was talking the same game. You know, there was a few of us <clears throat> talking about the same thing. But then you started meandering into, hey, what if we just cut out the whole process of eating to fix the body? Now, I'm oversimplifying it by saying that. But how does that work? Take us through it. Yeah, I mean, the the reason that I sort of got into it was, um, you know, the realization that this whole sort of uh, idea that calories was the most important thing to focus on. Obviously, it's been a complete failure, right? I mean, that's, you know, there's tons of people who are still adhering to all the, oh, you need to count your calories and, you know, create a calorie deficit. 
that's been the standard advice for like 50 years. And, you know, you see the results of that. It hasn't really worked. You really need to focus on more than just the number of qualities, but where those calories are coming from, right? And, and that's where I uh, looked at the science of it when I started to get into, you know, to be interested in weight loss, mostly as a medical issue, right? So my patients needed to lose weight for type 2 diabetes. That, that was... Um, you know, so the first thing that I really looked at was this whole idea that I had been taught, I had been sort of focused on, which is sort of cutting calories. And that didn't really make any sense to me. One, practically, it was a complete and utter failure, like not just a failure, but a sort of historic epic disaster. Um, that's just the fact, right? If you look at obesity rates and stuff. So then if you, if you sort of uh, think about physiologically, calories didn't make any sense, right? Because if you take 100 calories, your body can respond to those 100 calories completely differently, right? It, it right. creates hormones in response to certain calories. Like if you eat 100 calories of cookies, insulin will spike way up. If you eat 100 calories of like eggs, for example, it won't. So clearly the body is going to react completely differently because the hormones are our instructions as to what to do with those calories, right? So you put 100 calories in your mouth, your body can store it, or your body can burn it. And the idea is that which one it does is going to uh, depend on the hormones because that's how we get our instructions, right? So, you know, if we store it, then it's bad. If we burn, it's good. That's not the number of calories that was important. It was the hormones that was important, the instructions as to what to do with those calories, right? right. So like if you put fuel in your car, you can just let it sit there and it'll just stay in your, in your, in your gas tank, or you can drive it, right? Which right. one it does isn't, it doesn't depend on the amount of gas you put in the car, it depends on what you do with the car. So it's the same idea. And, and for some reason, all the sort of medical sort of experts and all that just completely ignored that. So that was what it's about. And that's where the sort of low carb and ketogenic and all that sort of stuff was focusing in on the hormone uh, aspect, the hormonal issue uh, of, of obesity, as opposed to the calorie issue of obesity. Because again, the idea is uh, they, they do get conflated. That is, if you take 100 calories and you put them immediately into storage, well, your body has no energy. So what is it going to do? It's going to tell you to go eat some more, right? So it wasn't that you weren't putting more calories in than storing them. That's just physics, right? The, the question is, why were you so hungry? Why were you looking to eat more? Because you shoved all of it into storage right away. And that's because of the hormones, right? So they're not sort of against each other. They all are on the same page, but it's focusing in on the proper aspect of what it is. And that's where I got into low carb. Then then I sort of, uh, so, so that was the science behind sort of- Wait, uh, uh, diets. We, wait hang on, let's just take a quick break. Um, I want to try something, even though we're on the air. Can you unplug uh, your headset and see, oh. let's see if that sounds better? No, don't take them out of your ears. Just unplug it and talk right into your computer. Oh, okay. Uh, I took the headset off. So, that, 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 that's that's better because it was rubbing on your collar. Oh, okay. okay There's okay. going to be yeah. some audio files. I can correct it on my end. I'm correcting your sound on my end. <laughs> so, Jason, okay. I have a question at this point before yeah. we get any deeper because – we can meander in. And I could just listen to you talk about this all day because I know what you're talking about, but I want to put it in. I want to pretend we're talking to people in third grade. Okay. The first thing someone will say, well, well, geez, of course, fasting works. You know, the guy's talking out of both ends of his mouth. Of course it works because there's thermodynamics and I'm always yelling about the whole thermo thermodynamic thing, right? Thermodynamics doesn't play into this the way people think it does. Am I wrong yeah. about that? No, you're totally right. I mean, thermodynamics has nothing to do with weight gain. It's funny how the weight loss people always talk about thermodynamics, but the thermodynamics people never talk about obesity <laughs> situation, right? Because really, uh, you know, this whole idea that it's, you know, so you have this energy balance equation, right? So body fat. So remember that body fat is a way to store calories, right? It's a storage system, just like you can store food in your fridge and, you know, you can store gas in your gas tank, whatever, right? It's just a storage system, right? So storage system, body fat and equals calories in, which is a, again, a unit of energy minus calories out. So there's three variables. 
which need to be balanced. And that's always true. That's all that thermodynamics tells you, okay? So if you reduce one of those three variables, so if you eat less, right? So you're reducing your calories in, then people say, well, you're going to lose body fat, right? Because it's gonna come out of storage. Well, that's not necessarily true because there are three variables. So if you reduce your calories in, you can balance that equation by either losing body fat, which is good, or reducing calories out, right? There's three variables. You right. reduce calories in, either one of those two variables can change to, 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 to balance the equation. When you look at the study, so, okay, so reducing calories in, according to this thermodynamic equation, which is always true, you either lose body fat or your energy expenditure goes down. So the question is, what actually happens when you do that? Well, we have studies going back like a hundred years, which tells you exactly what happens. If you simply focus on the wrong types of calories, right? You eat less, fewer calories, but all you know, sugar and grains and stuff, refined grains. Well, what happens is that when you reduce 500 calories in, your energy expenditure goes down 500 calories and you haven't lost any body fat, okay? So if you eat 500 less, burn 500 less, you haven't lost body fat. That doesn't go against any rules of thermodynamics, but every single scientific study, and in a lot of lectures I, I go through, I talk about the studies, there's like literally like 50 studies like that all show you the same thing that every time you simply just focus on calories and reduce calories, your body burns fewer calories. And that balances your equations so that you don't lose body fat. Because people always say, well, if you, suppose you're eating 2000 calories, burning 2000 calories. You go down to 1500 calories now. People, they say, well, you're going to lose body fat. No, you can either lose body fat or you can burn 500 less to balance that equation. Right, and it's very right. important. And what tells your body which one to do? Well, it's your hormones, of course, right? Hormones control every part of our aspect. So this whole idea that it's all thermodynamics is, is complete bogus. Anybody who says that, thermodynamics, you know they haven't really thought very hard about the entire process of weight loss. Because yeah. thermodynamics, calories, that's all about physics, right? Trying to balance your energy, it's not about physiology, which is the human body. It's sort of like saying, well, you develop a fever because there's more heat coming in than heat leaving. It's like, that's not a useful construct at all, right? Because it's like saying, okay, or saying that, well, you get rich, your bank account goes up if you have more money coming in and going out. So all you have to do is make more money or spend less money. Well, that's not useful information. You're really just reframing the, the question of how to get rich, right? How do you get more money coming in? Same thing, right? Um, so, so this whole idea that it's all about thermodynamics, I, I find it's 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 simplistic, and the people who who adhere to it don't like they're sort of on that sort of level one of knowledge, the one that's really dangerous because you just promote it. Yeah, they know just it. enough to get in trouble. So, all right, so let me yeah. be devil's advocate because someone's going to ask, well, I have a friend or I was on Weight Watchers, which is a SECO. It's a calorie in, calorie out proposition. Um, first, I'll give you my thoughts on it. <clears throat> yeah, uh, I, I've always said Weight Watchers is the world's biggest epidemiological study that we should be looking at because to the company's own admission, they only have a 2% success rate, which means, as you know, in science, 2% can be actually a negative five versus a plus two, right? It can go either way by five or six points. And we know that it's not going plus five. We know it's going negative five because if they're admitting to a 2% success rate, that means that it almost fails every single time. And people go, well, you know, Joyce over there lost 100 pounds on Weight Watchers. And I always say, yeah, Joyce white knuckled it all the way down 100 pounds. And then how much did Joyce put back on? Oh, wait, 120. So she actually put on 20% more weight than, you know, than she lost. What say you? 
Yeah, I agree. I mean, Weight Watchers focuses in very closely to the sort of whole calories in, calories out model. And that's really because most sort of uh, scientific obesity, you know, programs and yeah, they all do that, right? It makes no sense from a scientific standpoint, but that's what most of the sort of experts and academic doctors and stuff, you know, do. Like clearly there's a huge disconnect here because the sort of academic experts, right? The university experts, they say it's all about calories, right? They almost all say that. Mm -hmm. But it actually always fails in the real world. That's why nobody in the real world listens to them anymore, right? I mean, you look at the popularity of diets over the years. Right. Um, and some are good and some are not so good. But clearly the standard, if, if this whole calorie counting thing worked, the diet industry would be out of business, right? If, if these doctors at these universities were so smart, well, they put every diet, you know, person out of business. Then they go say, oh, people listen to these, you know, internet people. And it's like, well, that's because your stuff is even worse right. than the internet stuff, well, some of which is pretty bad, right? Yeah. So that's the whole idea, right? Um, and Weight Watchers adheres closely. They want to be as scientific as they can. So they try to do this. The problem is that the scientific people that they get, you know, are all sort of count your calories. It's like, look, if counting your calories worked, we have apps, we have nutrition labels, we have everything we need to count our calories. It doesn't work. Like you just got to face it, right? Yeah. I mean, you can try to deny it as much as you can, but you know, in the end, the results are the results, right? Obesity rates have gone straight up and the calorie counting hasn't helped at all. So, so the, you know, I think Weight Watchers, I think they try to do as good as, uh, you know, as much good as they can. The problem is that the advice they're getting as the advice most, most people are getting through the sort of, through the, uh, you know, the, the, the standard dietitians and the scientific communities, which is count your calories, which is basically eat less and move more, right? It's, it all just is very bad. So they're, they're sort of trying to be that, you know, they're trying to adhere to, to guidelines and stuff, but they're all bad, right? And so that's, that's their problem. I think it's, it's, that's why they fail people, unfortunately, but their failure is much more public because you can see they, people will vote with their feet, their stock price right. I mean, it's cratered in the last couple of years. Right. It's it's really just done poorly, so, uh, unfortunately. Um, I'm going to take a quick break, but I want to get right into fasting and <clears throat> and how that really works. Uh, folks, Villa Capelli Olive Oil, longest running sponsor of this show. Yeah, they were around back when Jason first started coming on the show. Um, Villa Capelli. Look, yeah, there's a lot of olive oil. People say, why can't I just go buy the Bartoli's at the store? It says 100 percent pure virgin olive oil, and it's got an Italian word written on the front of it. How can it be bad? Well, it could be bad because in this country, we allow um, up to 40% cut with seed oil, and still you can still call it 100% pure olive oil. Folks, this is not some kind of jargon I just decided to throw into an ad. I don't, I don't tell lies. You could go look at the uh, UC Berkeley olive oil study. Uh, you could go look at uh, there are books written on it. Extra virginity um, will explain how this all works. This is all done legally, not at Villa Capelli. You get 100% pure olive oil, and you will know it when you taste it. You will know it right away. You'll go, oh, wait, this does not taste like anything else I've ever had. They're not the only company doing this, but you know what? They're the only company that sponsors this show. So here's what we're going to do. 10%. Put in promo code Vinny. V-I-N-N-I-E, no wimpy Y, 10% off at Villa Capelli. If you spend over $125 over at Villa Capelli, after the discount code, you will also get free shipping. So buy a lot of olive oil. If you keep it in a cool, dry place, it does not go rancid. The seed oil stuff will go rancid. Real olive oil, cool, dry place, it will last for a long time. 
uh, promo code Vinny, V-I-N-N-I-E, 10% off at Villa Capelli. We're talking to the guy who wrote The Obesity Code. He, uh, he wrote a lot of books. He wrote, um, um, he, he wrote uh, The Cancer Code. Uh, he wrote The Diabetic Code. <clears throat> the guy's very busy writing books. And these books are great. They're all in the Vinny Totteridge Book Club. If you go to VinnyTotteridge.com, you'll see all of Dr. Jason Fung's books there. You can get them. <clears throat> Jason, I, I feel like I led you down what we talked about because people go, well, wait a minute. If, if calorie in, calorie out doesn't work, what is, what is fasting? Isn't that calorie in, calorie out? Is it? Is it not? It, it is and it isn't, I suppose. So part of it is the calories part of it, of course. But the more important part of it is the way it affects your hormones. Because again, the hormones are the instructions we want. It basically tells what do you want your body to do? Okay, so if you want your body to burn body fat, remember body fat is just a store of calories, right? So if you, so, you know, you can take two situations. You can take a situation where you're eating constantly right, which was the standard advice a few years ago, right, eat six meals a day, eat 10 meals a day, they said that's going to make you lose weight, of course, nobody lose, lost weight on that, it was terrible advice, there was no scientific evidence to back that up whatsoever, like zero, like honestly, zero studies, somehow it became the sort of predominant way of eating, but it had actually zero studies, but the thing is that there's, if you take those two situations, you have to look at what is the difference with fasting if you take out the calorie side of things, right? The fasting, what it does is it allows your insulin levels to fall, okay? So insulin is a nutrient sensor. That is, it tells your body that nutrients are coming in. So when you eat, insulin goes up generally. Um, and it tells your body, hey, energy is coming in, food energy, calories. I need to store some of those calories because there's going to be a time when I'm not eating. So therefore, when I'm not eating, I need to store that away. So you can't use all of it immediately. You want to see, you need to store some of it. So that's what insulin does. So if you eat and you eat and you eat all the time and insulin stays high all the time, you can do the same thing if you simply just give yourself insulin injections all the time. You can do exactly the same thing. Um, then what happens is that your body is always storing body fat, right? It's a store of calories. And you can't burn body fat, right? So if you're storing body fat, energy is going into the body you're storing it you can't burn it right because your body's not going to burn it and store it at the same time because right. it's just working against each other you're either storing it or you're burning it okay you can't do both at the same time so if your insulin is high if you're eating all the time insulin stays high your body's always in a fat storing mode you simply cannot flip the switch and burn energy because you haven't let your body you haven't let the insulin levels fall so that your body can use it We've known this again for 40, 50 years that insulin inhibits lipolysis. That's a fancy way of saying that insulin stops your body from burning fat. Again, why? Because you're storing fat, right? You either store it, it's, a, it's, it's like a one way you know, street, right? It can only go one way at a time. You can either go in or energy can go in, that is store body fat, or it can go out, which is burn body fat. And which way you flip it depends on insulin. So if your insulin levels are high, you cannot burn body fat. That insulin inhibits lipolysis. If you uh, fast, then you allow your insulin levels to fall. There are other ways to do it, of course. You can use low carbohydrate diets, for example, because you're eating foods that don't stimulate insulin so much. So again, even when you eat, you're going to eat it, but then insulin is going to fall, so then you're going to burn it. So the point is that it's more than just the calories part of the intermittent fasting. It's the, uh, you're giving your body the sort of time it needs for insulin to fall so that you can burn body fat. You really can't lose weight by eating. Like it's actually physically impossible, right? While you're eating, your body is, cannot burn body fat. It can't do that. So why would you eat 10 times a day? You're right. putting 10 periods of time in the day that your body cannot actually burn body fat at all. Like it doesn't happen. 
So the point is that you need to allow your body to fast periodically so that you can burn off this stuff that you stored, which is why people have this English word called breakfast, break your fast. You're supposed to feed, right? Then that's when you store your calories. Then you need to fast where you're gonna burn those calories that you stored. If you keep those in balance, then you're going to stay body weight neutral. So, it, you know, on the one hand, maybe, um, you know, the, the, yes, you do eat fewer calories while you fast. The other important thing is that you're allowing your insulin levels to fall so that you can make up those calories. So from your stores of calorie, right, you're going to be able to take those calories out of body fat and burn them for energy. If you don't do that, then what happens, which is what happens in, in, in standard advice, is that when you eat fewer calories, you burn fewer calories and you don't take any out of body fat because you put this block, right? So it's just like you put a lock on your fridge door. You can't put any in, you, you know, you can't take any out, right? If you can't take any out, how are you going to empty it? You can't. Right. Right. That's the point. That's what fasting does. And it's, it's not necessarily you know, 16 hours or 24 hours or 24 days even, right? It, it can be whatever you want. In the, in the 70s, for example, people generally ate at 6 p.m., had breakfast at 8 a.m. That's a 14-hour period of fasting that yeah. everybody did every day without even thinking about it. 14 hours. Then, you know, when we started talking, people thought 12 hours fasting was a cruel and unusual punishment that you're going to put your body into shock practically right it was crazy it's like but you know that everybody did 14 hours every day without thinking about it and if you're a naughty boy and got sent to bed without dinner you did 20 hours without blinking right your body didn't care because your body's so smart it says i don't have any food coming in let me take it out of my body fat stores because i have 200, 300, 400,000 calories sitting in the stores. What do I care if I need 2,000 today? I have 200,000 sitting there in storage, right? So your body doesn't have to reduce the amount it burns because it has so much in storage. Now, if you eat all the time and you cannot access those 200, 300, 400,000 in storage, if you only get 1,500 in a day, but you have no access to your body fat stores, how can you balance that energy balance equation, right? Body fat equals calories in minus calories out. You've locked up the body fat. You can't get at it because you've kept insulin high. You reduce your calories into 1500. The only way you can balance it is to reduce your energy expenditure to 1500. So people's metabolic rate goes down. They get cold. They get tired. They feel like crap. And they're not losing any body fat, which is exactly what happened when people did that. <clears throat> So I, I want to clear up <clears throat> because, you know, people are always asking me, I do these consults every day, five days a week. Um, they'll say, well, should I be doing IF, intermittent fasting? You just brought that up. You know, we used to automatically go 14 hours a day. Now, you know, we think it's crazy to go just a few hours. What is an intermittent fast? What does it mean? And how does that differ from when you guys put someone on a medical fast where you're going two days, three days, five days. Explain the difference between those two, please. There's no real difference. Uh, the process is still the same. It's a process of lowering insulin. And, and a lot of the stuff we do medically is also just like 16 hours, 20 hours, 24 hours, right? So a lot of people are older, they're on medications, you don't want to take it as hard as but basically, if 14 hours is your sort of standard as to what everybody can do, like, because, you know, everybody in the 70s did it, no problem, right? Um, the, the point is that if you want to now lose weight, as opposed to staying weight stable, remember, they're not eating great in the 70s either. It's all white bread, you know, white rice and stuff. But if you want to give them more time, then you can extend it to from 14 hours to like 16 hours, for example. And what you're trying to do is not to eat more. Don't try and pack everything that you used to eat in eight hours. That's not the point, right? Yes, you're going to pack more in. You're going to store more in, and you're giving your more time, yourself more time to burn it off. But you know, if you, you know, just because you packed it in, you're going to not going to get the benefit. The idea is that you're going to eat normally. You're just going to drop one of those meals, 
So say you drop breakfast. So you're eating say 500 fewer calories, but you don't wanna tack on the extra 500 into the, your eating window. You want that 500 calories to come out of your body fat. Body fat is just the store of your energy. Your body will take that 500 out. If you drop breakfast, you take 500 calories out, but you add 500 extra to your eating window, you put that 500 back in, right? But the point is that you're just, when you shorten your eating window, most people will naturally eat less. And you're gonna take the remainder from the, the body fat stores. And because your body now has access to those stores, body fat stores, you don't have to reduce your energy expenditure or your calories out, right? Uh -huh. When you didn't have access to the body stores, your body was forced to reduce its energy expenditure, right? Again, think of it like, money, right? You can have money in the bank, right? But what if the bank is closed? Well, you have no access to that money. So if you make, you know, say you make $2,000 a day, right? To correspond to 2,000 calories and you spend $2,000 a day, right? Mm -hmm. Say the bank is closed. Now you get 1,500 calories coming in or $1,500 coming in, but the bank is closed. That's your body fat, right? What do you do? You have to balance. There's no other way to not balance. You balance it by only spending 1500 calories or $1,500, right? Same thing. Right. But what if you're, the bank is open? You take, you, you make 1500, you're taking in $1,500 or 1500 calories. You take $500 from your bank account or 500 calories from your body fat stores. All of a sudden your body can now use 2000 calories or $2,000 because the bank was open or the bank was closed. That's the most important factor. And that's controlled by insulin. That is the main hormone controlling it. There are other ones, of course, but that's the main one. So that's why it's so important to focus in on the hormones and what happens to your body with those hormones, right? And that's what fasting is about. It's about lowering insulin. Okay, let, let me continue to be a naysayer. <clears throat> I'm a guy um, on the internet yelling, and this is where I get all this from Jason, just people that you and I yell at on the internet, or we get yelled at by on the internet, I don't really yell back. Um, guy on the internet goes, Hey, you start fasting, yeah, you'll burn some fat calories. But what about all the muscle you're taking with it? Go. Yeah, <laughs> the whole idea. I mean, I don't know why people make this like, well, I don't know why people confuse themselves, honestly. Right. What you eat and don't, like muscle is not a store of energy. Like if you eat more, you don't build muscle, okay? <laughs> like it would be great if that happened. We'd all be like, you know, Schwarzenegger. Sure. But it doesn't happen. Muscle grows or doesn't grow based on how much you use it, okay? That's not a surprise, right? If you have, if you put your muscle under stress, you lift weights, your body responds by getting stronger. If you don't use your muscles, like you lie in bed all day, say you're sick, you're bedridden, you, you can't believe how quick that muscle just goes away. Yeah. Very, very fast. Okay. And, and, and it's like astronauts, right? You go up in space, they don't have gravity. They start losing muscle and they start losing bone immediately right? It's just how much you use it, right? That's, that's what the body responds to. So where does eating come into all this? Like, and this is assuming that you have adequate nutrition otherwise, right? So you have too much body fat and so on. It doesn't make any sense. If your body were to stop, if you're to stop eating, why would your body be so stupid as to burn muscle? Muscle is not a store of energy. Muscle is functional tissue. It goes up and down depending on how much you use it. Well, if you don't eat, then you're going to use your stores of energy, which is sugar and fat, not muscle. It's like, it's, it's sort of like, oh, you know, I stored up firewood for the winter, but as soon as it gets cold, I'm going to chop up my sofa, and throw it in the fire, right? Like, why would you do that? Why would our, the human body be so stupid? Like, why do you assume the human body is just so dumb? Like, it's a completely separate issue, right? You 
you you you get stronger by using it. You get weaker by not using it. Eating has very little to do with it, assuming that you have adequate you know energy otherwise, right? Protein and all that. Other right. Stuff. Sure. You are you know completely protein deficient and stuff. Sure, you can't build muscle, but it's a very small part of the problem. A lot of people when they you know start losing fat actually their muscles may actually get smaller because of all the fat inside the muscle. I mean, if you look at a piece of beef, for example, cattle, you can get well-marbled steak, right? That's fat inside the muscle. That's not supposed to be there. We put it there by feeding them all these grains, right? If you have right. grass-fed beef, they don't get that. You get muscle, like you get, you, you, you get the steak. There's no fat inside it all that fat inside it makes it bigger, of course. So if you lose intramuscular fat, yes, your muscle will get smaller, but you're just losing the fat inside that muscle. Right. So, you know, I just don't understand why people always say this. And I've heard the same thing too. Oh, you lose muscle, you lose muscle. Like, no, your body's just not that stupid, right? If it was so stupid, we wouldn't have survived, right? If you look at people who, you know, you know, ancient, you know, ancestral people like cavemen, cavemen, right? Or, or people who live, uh, you know, on nature and stuff. They'd have periods where they ate a lot and periods where they didn't eat a lot. Well, they're not all like emaciated little blobs of fat just running around like the, right. the Native Americans or something, right? They're living on the land or, you know, they're not, you know, they're going to have these feeding fasts and cycles. They're, you know, they're very strong, you know, muscled, well-built people. They're not just pure blobs of fat running around. So clearly the whole idea is just sort of, I don't know. I don't know where it comes from, but it makes no sense from a physiologic standpoint. I'd love to build muscle by eating. I won't. I only build muscle if I lift heavy things. Yeah. And look, I, uh, my training is in exercise physiology. The thing we learned <clears throat> is you can build muscle, you, your muscle divides and conquers the same at 80 years old as it does at 14. The main difference is when you're 14, you have a lot more testosterone. So you recover a lot faster, and you're able to build it fast. But people go, well, you can't build muscle after a certain age, and, and they start using fancy words they don't understand like sarcopenia. And I read where sarcopenia, you don't have a choice. It's like, well, I'll always say, explain me, I'm, I'm 60 years old. And if I took my shirt off, my body doesn't look like your average 60 year old. I'm not bragging, that's a fact. But I've been working out since I was eight years old, and I haven't stopped. You know, went all the way through college, played D1 football, I still go to the gym every day or use the gym that's directly behind me, or the stationary bike or the rowing machine, or I go outside and run and walk and jog and do whatever you can keep it going with muscle and keeping your bones and your tendons and all of your connective tissue strong. If you just use it, right, your muscle will build at the same rate. I'll be honest with you. I have to be much more on top of my rest game than my exercise game. I can still do it all. I just have to make sure I get the proper amount of sleep and get the proper diet and do everything right. And you can continue to do it. And by the way, I'm not the only one doing it. There's a lot of people like me out there that can keep it going into perpetuity. And look, even the the, the late great um, Jack LaLanne, yeah, he started to look smaller and weaker and the whole thing, but the guy was still strong into his 90s. The, the guy was still doing it into his 90s. So yes, you can keep it going as you get older. Um, Jason, uh, one big question I get, and boy, I really have trouble explaining this. You know, I, I talk to a lot of morbidly obese people, five, six hundred pound people, and they'll start doing an SNG or low carb or keto, or whatever they want to call it. They'll start doing it and they're, they've lost 50, 100 pounds and they get interested in, you know, their blood. Now everyone has a CGM and not everyone, but people have them now and they have questions as to what they see on these CGMs or when they're pricking their fingers and and everything else. Um, and the big term comes up the dawn effect, you know, they'll, they'll see, you know, especially if they're fasting three, four, five days in a row. And 
um, they'll they'll have this dawn effect. Can you explain how that works and why it, it happens the way it does? And pretend yeah. again that you're talking to a kindergartner when you explain this. Yeah, Please. so it's uh, very simple. So the dawn effect is when your blood sugar goes up uh, overnight. So what happens? So at night, for example, if you check your blood sugar, it's normal. And then in the morning, when you check it again, it's high. And people are sleeping, so they're not eating. And they go, how did that happen? And it's really very simple, right? There's what you're putting in. There's how much is in the blood. And there's a huge pool of stored glucose in your body, mostly in your liver, right? So if you didn't put it in, where did that sugar come from? Why did your blood sugar goes up? Well, it came from what you had stored in the body. Simple. So again, it's, it's just like um, any other storage system, same as body fat, same as a refrigerator, for example. So if you go to a store and you have food on the table and you have a fridge, a storage system, right? If you at night you go to bed and there's nothing on the table, you didn't go to the store and there's food on the table when you came out in the morning, you wouldn't say, wow, that's a real mystery. No, it came from your refrigerator, right? It came from your storage system. Same thing in the blood. You didn't eat. So that sugar didn't come from food. It didn't magically appear. It came from the stored sugar, mostly in the liver. That's it. So all you've done is you've taken sugar that you stored away that you couldn't see, right? It's not in the blood, it's in the liver. You couldn't see it, but it's there. And you simply moved it into the blood. Why does the body do that? Because it's getting ready for the day ahead. This actually happens to everybody. It's a normal effect, but usually the effect is so small and nobody really cares that much. You go from sort of, you know, normal to a little normal, but slightly higher than before. So it's, it's really a very small effect in some people. But if your sugars are high already, and you have a lot of stored sugar is gonna move out. So essentially you're just taking sugar that you've stored away and moving it into the blood so you can use it. Is that a bad thing? No, not at all. If you're fasting, same thing can happen. If your blood sugar goes up, where did it come from? Well, it came from your stores. You're burning off your stores, which is great because just like you know your refrigerator, it's a way to store food. Your liver has a way to store sugar. Now it's bursting to full, right? So imagine you have a fridge that's just so full that you can barely close it. Well, if you move some of it out of there, that's good. It's not bad. It's good. Right. You need to do more fasting to get rid of that so that it's it's unloaded. Same thing with your liver. Your liver, once it gets the signal that it can release sugar, it's just pumping out sugar like there's no tomorrow. Why? Because it has too much. That's all it is. So, you know, this dawn effect, is simply the rise in blood sugar when you don't eat. That's only one way your blood sugar can go up. It can go up when you eat or it can go up when your body releases it. So that's all it's doing, right? And, and it's very, um, it's, it's not, it doesn't mean you're doing anything wrong. In fact, it's a natural response to fasting. You see it people overnight. It's just, it just means you have work to do to get rid of that. Is it the same? Um, I know I sometimes I'll check if I'm if I'm doing something steady state like my uh, spinner, and I spend 90 minutes on my spinner in zone two. Um, I've always noticed I don't wear a CGM, but if I get off and prick my finger within 10 or 15 minutes, <clears throat> my blood sugar will be up from its normal resting blood sugar. Is that the same as the dawn effect? Or Absolutely. is it something different? It's the same thing, your body is releasing sugar for you to use. So as you start exercising, your body's like, oh, wait, you need some energy here. You need some energy. Glucose is a right. source of energy. You need energy. Let me release some of it. So when you stop and check it immediately, it's like, oh, your sugar's up. They'll go down. Go up. Yeah, don't, yeah don't they'll go up immediately. Yeah. And then when you, when you rest and recover, your body's like, okay, you're resting and recovering, and they'll just take it back into storage, right? So it's a totally normal thing. It doesn't mean it's either good or bad. There's nothing wrong with it. Um, it's just that's the way it is. It's just the body's stored sugar coming out. I find the same thing happens with uh, ketones. Uh, I tell folks, it be, they get so hung up on the number of ketones. And they'll say, oh, when I wake up in the morning, I'm only at 0.4 or 0.3 or 0.7. I'm not even one millimolar. And I'll go, okay, me too. I live in dietary ketosis. Me too. I, I'm, I'm nowhere near one. 
but I, I'll say, look, if you want to do a party trick, go hiking for two or three hours. And, and before you, your ketones come down, when your body's making a lot of ketones, check it, then you'll get yourself a 2.5 or 3.6 or some really cool number. But it then down regulates itself once your body clears those ketones out. What say you? Yeah, absolutely. It's the same thing. Ketones are a source of energy, just like glucose. It's not as easy to measure as, as you know, because with the CGMs, it's, it's, it's much easier. And of course, that technology was more developed with the, you know, for the diabetic and so on. With ketones, right. there's less reason to monitor it on a continuous sort of basis. But um, yeah, ketones are a source of energy. In fact, ketones, again, people were so worried about ketones when the keto diet started, if you yeah. remember. People are like, oh my God, right? It's like, remember, ketones are normal. When you don't eat, you know, uh, carbs, your right. body must rely on fat, right? The body has two energy sources, glucose and, which is sugar, and fat. If you eat zero carbs, uh, the, that is a ketogenic diet or very low carbs, then your body must use fat. And when you burn fat, your body generates ketones because that goes through the blood brain barrier to feed the brain. So that's normal. It's a completely normal thing. People used to say, well, your ketones are so high, something's wrong. It's like, no, this is the normal expected response. Same thing when you fast, the ketones go up. Why? Because you, you, if you burn through your, your sugar, your body has to then go to fat metabolism, which is really what you want, right? That's the whole point. Like if you don't burn fat, you cannot lose body fat. You have to burn it, right? It, it, it doesn't just come off by magic. So that's the that's the whole idea of the ketogenic me measuring your ketones. People want to see that they're sort of in this fat burning state, which is which is fine. It's not the only way to lose weight, but it's 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 a reasonable one. Can we just touch on ghrelin and leptin for just a minute and explain what that is? Because people yeah, ghrelin is the hunger hormone. So if it's high, you're hungry. If it's low, you're not hungry. And people used to always um, think that uh, fasting would just raise your ghrelin. It doesn't actually do that. So when you fast, yes, ghrelin will spike up if you're used to eating. Then if you don't eat, ghrelin just goes back down. Why? Because the body just has taken the energy it needs out of its body fat. So say it's lunchtime, you normally eat 500 calories at lunch. You don't eat. Then your body takes 500 calories out of your body fat starts. You take 500 out, but you have like 200,000 in there, right? So no big deal. You take 500 out. Why do you need to eat? Well, you don't. Your body just pushes down the ghrelin. If you fast for long periods of time, so days and days and days, so usually after about two, three days, Overall, ghrelin starts to go down. And that's the secret to why people can do seven days, 20 days, 30 days at a time. You think, wow, they must be hungry all the time. They're actually not. Their physical hunger actually has gone down tremendously as they start fueling themselves on their own body fat. They actually are not hungry. What it is, is more of a psychological thing that is, oh, that slice of pizza looks really delicious, right? It's mm -hmm. not that you're hungry. You actually have no physical hunger, but you have this, you know, psychological, it's like, ooh. Um, so that's more, that's more the problem than anything else. So that's ghrelin. And it's very interesting to look at that because again, if you look at, um, you know, why people are so against fasting, the whole idea was that it's going to make you so hungry that you're not going to be able to control yourself, but that's not borne out by any science whatsoever. In fact, if you talk to anybody who does fast regularly, they'll tell you that their appetite goes down, right? And they always say things like, I think my stomach shrank. It's like, well, your stomach did shrink a little bit, but it's mostly that you're sort of resetting that body. Leptin is uh, a different hormone. It was very huge, like 15 years ago. So leptin, when you uh, eat, so people, you have to realize that body fat percentage is actually very tightly controlled. In the wild, you don't have very obese animals because they die. If you have too much body fat, like you're obese, then you're going to not be able to catch prey or you're going to get eaten. If, you're, if you eat vegetables and you're obese, for example, 
some wolf or lion or something is just going to kill you because you're fat. You can't move as fast, right? Because there's more bulk to move. So being overweight is very dangerous in the wild. Being underweight is also very dangerous because, again, you have no stores. If there's no food available, you're going to die. So your body actually wants to maintain itself in a very tight sort of range. And the way it does this is that if you eat and your fat cells you know, get bigger, your fat cells will actually release a hormone called leptin. And that leptin is going to go to your brain and tell you to stop eating. It's going to make you anorexic. That is, it's going to lower your appetite so that you don't eat. And as you don't eat, those fat cells then shrink and then you maintain yourself in a normal body fat range. So for a while, people thought, oh, well, obesity was because you don't have enough leptin. So they made leptin at the time. It was a huge deal. And they thought, well, if you just inject people who are overweight with leptin, they won't eat and they'll lose weight. Turns out that didn't work at all. Um, it, it worked didn't... in dogs, though, right? We, we were able to do it in animals, but not humans. Is, is that the truth? Or it, is it just something I heard? Uh, it, was, it was in uh, people who had a very rare leptin deficiency. So there were some very rare cases of people with leptin deficiency mm -hmm. where they didn't have leptin. So they actually could never be full. Right? So the leptin tells your body, stop eating. Well, they couldn't stop eating. So they're always hungry, always hungry, kept eating, eating, eating. And so when they gave those people leptin, they actually completely cured them. But that's because their leptin was low and they gave them leptin. Right. Most obesity, regular standard obesity, leptin is too high. And it's because and the body is resistant to the effect of this leptin. So really, it's, it's this kind of... Um, you know, balance trying you're trying to balance your leptin, which is trying to tell you to stop, and uh, you know your your you know the food that is trying to push it up. Um, and and the real issue is these a lot of these satiety hormones um, in processed foods. So if you eat a lot of processed foods, they actually get around a lot of your satiety signals. Your satiety signals are sort of uh, lower down the line, right? They're, 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 when you eat, you send off signals to stop eating, right? So when you eat, so if you think about a buffet or something, you go to a buffet, you can't just keep eating forever. At some point, you become physically sick and they're, you know, pr you eat protein, you develop protein, peptide YY, which tells you to stop at some point. So you, if you finish that buffet, you can't eat another piece of beef or steak because all right. that protein it's just going to feel a lot of nauseous, right? Uh, fat does the same thing with cholecystokinin. If you eat a lot of uh, volume, you have stretch receptors in the stomach. So those all tell you to stop eating. If you get around all that and you simply, and, and this is where processed foods come in, you get rid of all those tidy signals, you take away the protein, take away the fat, you eat things like white bread or sugary foods, which are sort of pure carbohydrate. They have no bulk, so they don't stretch your stomach receptors. When that happens, of course, then you keep eating, your fat cells go up, leptin goes up. At, at, it will keep keep it down for some at some point. If you keep eating those refined foods, what happens is leptin just stays high for a long time. And when that happens, you develop leptin resistance, right? And it's no different. Whenever you have high levels of a hormone for a long time, your body reacts to it by time becoming resistant to it. So say, you know, it happens everywhere. So say you wear, ear, uh, you know, headphones and you put the music too loud, right? Like a lot of these teenagers do. You're listening to loud music. What happens if you listen to it for a long time, for too loud, you become deaf. Right. Why? Because your body's reacting to it. It becomes resistant to that loud noise. It's actually trying to protect itself against that loud noise, right? It becomes deaf. If you then turn up the volume to get the same effect, then it actually makes it worse. You become more DAC, right? The idea is you have to take it away. Same thing. So high levels of a hormone for too long give you resistance. If you're left in levels, so eating highly processed foods too often gives you high left in levels. High left in levels over a long period of time gives you left in resistance, which makes it difficult for you to lose weight because then you're getting hungry. It makes it worse. What you have to do is take away the sort of root cause, which is a lot of those refined foods, and get back to sort of natural foods.
Final question. <clears throat> um, I would be remiss if I didn't and I want to be respectful of your time. But everyone wants to know <clears throat> what breaks a fast. And I'm always getting this question, hey, if I put a little cream in my first cup of coffee, or if I have just a little coconut oil on a spoon, does that break my fast? What actually I want to hear from the horse's mouth, Jason, you're the horse. Uh, tell me exactly what breaks a fast. Um, well, really, any food will technically break a fast, right? But the idea of fasting is you're trying to lower your insulin levels, right? To, because insulin is that flip, right? If you're mm -hmm. high, you're going to store calories. If insulin is low, you're going to burn calories. So you want to get it down. If you're fasting, insulin is going down and down and down. You get a little cream in your coffee. Well, you know what? It might flatten out for five minutes, 10 minutes. Right. But that's all, right? Because you only took a little bit of cream. You didn't drink a whole cup of it, right? Right. And insulin is going to start going down again, right? So as long as you're taking very little, it's not going to make a difference. It's not like, um, you know, oh, I drank a little cream of coffee. I have to start at zero, right? You're just taking a little pause. And same thing with a lot of these things like bone broth and a little coconut oil and all that sort of stuff. You're just putting a little pause on it for a little while. And then when that wears off, if you take a lot, of course, it's going to go and pause for a long time. But if you only take a little bit, it's just going to keep going down. So if you're if you only take a little bit of cream or a little bit of coconut oil or whatever it is, um, yeah, no big deal. You're gonna you're gonna start getting the benefits again as soon as you go go off. So you don't have to worry so much about it. People get worried because it's like, oh, you know, I had a little cream. You know, I was at ten hours. Now I have to start at zero. Just right. No. So you're still basically fasting. <laughs> because some people say, well, you know, I was doing a two day fast, but I had coffee with cream or I had yeah. some coconut oil. Yeah. or something. So that's not really stopping the fast. You're, you're not going to a pause it. and then you're going to start going down again. Yeah, exactly. Now, if you eat a full meal, right? Right. That, boom, insulin's going to not just flatten out for a little bit, but you eat, you know, dinner, like a thousand calories of mixed whatever, you know, mixed carbs and proteins and fats. Well, you, your insulin going down, 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 down. You can't count that, right? It's, if right. you're only taking a little, you're just going to flatten out and then go down, right? So it's it's not a big deal. It's more understanding the process of what's happening, which is flipping that switch, getting your hormone levels down. And remember, the longer you've had the obesity, the longer, the harder it's going to be because of this leptin resistance, because insulin levels are going to stay high. People who develop this insulin resistance get high insulin levels. So it's it's harder the longer you have it, which is which is to be expected once you understand you know and that's why some people say they are like oh you know why can that person lose it so fast like well their situation is quite different they may not have had it for a long time people who have had obesity for a long time have more trouble losing weight that's just true right right if you gain a lot of weight very recently it's generally easy to lose it that's yeah. why you don't want to let it get too far out of control well, look, I tell that to people all the time, you stayed at the party too long. Now you have to stay away from the party for, for forever just to make it work. Jason, I do want to be respectful. Um, I can't thank you enough for coming on. If you can hang for a second, I'd like to say goodbye to you off the air. Sure. Folks, um, you know what to do. We all go shopping on Amazon. Before you go to Amazon, go to vinnytotteries.com, click through the banner. It puts a little coal on the fire. It gets our train down the track. We also have the super fan page at vinnytotteries.com and the PDF. You can go check the PDF out at <clears throat> vinnytotteries.com. All of Dr. Jason Fung's books are on or in my book club at vinnytotteries.com. Go there. It'll take you right to the Amazon page and you'll see those books in the book club. Every time he put a book out, we would have him on. I would read the book. Once it clears me, it goes into the book club. So Jason Fung is always great in my books. Uh, thank you, Jason. Um, on behalf of Dr. Jason Fung, my name is Vinnie Totorich. Put life into living and do it with enthusiasm. <laughs>